As we mentioned at the top of this newscast, President Joe Biden will be in El Paso tomorrow. He plans to discuss a new immigration parole plan. The night team's Alyssa Cole spoke with an immigration law professor who says this new policy could have devastating effects. President Joe Biden plans to see border enforcement operations in El Paso Sunday after announcing a new parole process that includes turning away Venezuelans, Nicaraguans, Cubans and Haitians who illegally crossed the border from Mexico. Instead, the Department of Homeland Security will accept 30,000 people from those four countries a month and offer them an opportunity to work legally. It's also going to have devastating effects on asylum seekers who don't know anyone in the U.S. or don't have anybody who meet the criteria to be a sponsor in order to qualify for the parole program. Erica Schomer is a clinical law professor at St. Mary's University. She says the parole process fails to meet the U.S.'s criteria for asylum under the Refugee Convention. Anybody who makes it to our soil and has a genuine fear of return would be allowed to follow through with that process. Um, it does not seem like that is going to be the case. Whether migrants are seeking asylum or not, they'll have to apply for parole from their home country. I'm not opposed to us creating a process by which someone can apply for asylum outside of the U.S., but I do have significant safety concerns about people's ability to do it and also how long that process will take on our end. Alyssa Cole, KSAT 12 News. Completely shifting gears here. This year's cold for a cause polar bear plunge saw higher temperatures than last year and organizers hope the donations will match. The fundraiser is put on by the Schertz Family YMCA. The money goes towards the Open Doors Scholarship Program, which allows families or individuals to participate in YMCA programs regardless of their financial situation. Whether warm or cold, those who plunge today say it was worth the dip. It was cold. Last year was a lot was worse, um, and it's always good to you know help our community in any way we can. And this was a good opportunity for my son and I to do it together, have some fun. Could have been worse. Each person who participated gave at least a twenty dollar donation. If that pulls anything like mine. Mine was down to like in the 40s right before Christmas yeah. when we had that cold snap. In the last few days, it's warmed back up into the 60s. Not Tim temperature, but Daisy the swimming dog likes that. Kind of <laughs> Would make She's sense. She's been back in the pool. And yep. it's warmer than usual. That, that's correct. Over the past several days, we've had warmer than average temperatures to kind of kickstart 2023. All after, as Tim just mentioned, that cold snap that we had over the Christmas holiday to wrap up 2022. But yes, the other big thing that we saw today was the humidity that rushed back into South Central Texas this morning. We had some areas of fog out there on area roadways that actually were pretty dense in spots. We saw some reduced visibilities out there. That muggy feel was with us for a good portion of the day today. And for some, we still do have some of that stickiness out there, but a cool front is actually moving through as we speak, and it has sparked up some scattered rain and a couple of thunderstorms, especially southeast of San Antonio. Now, right off the bat, kind of a wide view at the radar, you can see here in San Antonio points farther off to the west and really due south. We don't have a whole lot going on. The bulk of the rain and storm activity has really been focused across our southeastern counties over the past few hours. It actually looks like we just got a new severe thunderstorm warning in for still portions of DeWitt County just south of Cuero as this strong thunderstorm continues to push farther down to the southeast. Likely some wind gusts upwards of 60 miles per hour possible with this particular storm and hail up to the size of quarters. We did have a previous severe thunderstorm warning that was issued for the far western portions of DeWitt County through 1045. I'll get the latest details on this one here in just a few. But again, that is moving through DeWitt County. So if you are in this yellow polygon, you will want to make sure that you are indoors. Still do have some non severe, but a few more thunderstorms on the west side of that activity through Carnes County closer to Highway 
Highway 181 near Carn City and Fall City. You can see a couple of thunderstorms also making their way into the northern portions of DeWitt County just to the north of that severe warned storm. Really a broken line of rain has been what we found across our southeastern counties this evening. That does stretch into northern Lavaca County, Hallettsville, seeing a little cell there as well, slowly make its way farther off to the east. The good news is the heavy, heavy rain that had kind of just parked itself over northern Lavaca County earlier this evening has now moved out, but it leaves behind a flash flood warning that will continue until midnight, and this is why. Radar estimates a little pocket there near Molten up to five to even eight inches of rain fell, so likely some issues out there on the roadway. So probably just a good idea to not be out on the roadways in northern Lavaca County. If you are, be extra, extra careful, especially because it is dark outside. We also have some flood advisories that were issued for southern Gonzales County. You can see a little pocket there estimated between about two to four inches of rain and then into Carnes County just to the east of Highway 181 there another pocket of three to even six inches of rain that was able to fall with some of those thunderstorms that have just been very slow to move over the past several hours. And again, that is all thanks to a cool front that has been working its way through South Central Texas here tonight. It is possible that we find an isolated brief light shower here in San Antonio. I don't have high hopes for that right now as we head into the overnight hours. I think the bulk of the rest of the activity is going to be situated across our far southeastern counties into the early morning hours of our Sunday. The bulk of that shifts down closer to the coast. Maybe a few isolated lingering showers possible by the time the sun comes up, mainly situated over the coastal plains, and then we dry things out throughout the remainder of the day. Again, we'll keep eyes on that potential to find a couple more strong storms in our southeastern counties before the sun comes up tomorrow. Just monitoring trends there as well. Temperature wise, we're in the 50s and 60s in and around the San Antonio area. Overnight tonight, we see those morning lows dip down into the 40s and low 50s to kickstart our Sunday. Some more morning cloud cover leads way to partly cloudy skies into the afternoon and those daytime highs look to climb their way into the upper 60s and low 70s across the area. Also could be a little breezy at times tomorrow tomorrow morning with some wind gusts upwards of about 20 to 25 miles per hour. Those winds do subside a bit into the afternoon, but what they will do is filter in some lower humidity. So if you didn't like that mugginess today, like me, you'll like tomorrow because it's going to feel just a little bit more comfortable out there, guys. That's what makes the difference is the humidity. Yeah, but it's not going to filter out the uh, mountain seer. So no, sure you know, won't, just, just to throw that out there. <laughs> he has to complain about something. <laughs> All right, Andrew, the Spurs playing host of the Celtics tonight and a familiar face. That's right. Derek White is back in town. Former Spur Greg Popovich was excited to see him. How did the Spurs greet him with a tough performance? We come back. We'll talk about the rookies and how they performed against the Celtics tonight. Plus, Antonian put on a show in boys high school basketball. Got that too next. Derek White is back in town, bringing his Celtics to the AT&T Center to face the silver and black, and wasn't a great start for the home team tonight. Jalen Brown calls his own number and hits the three, capping a 13-2 Boston run to start the game. But the Spurs claw their way back into it. Josh Richardson finds Jeremy Sohan for the triple. That's good, cutting the deficit down to six. Then later in the frame, Richardson drains his own three ball. That ties it up at 30, and the Spurs only trail by three after one quarter of play. Second quarter now, Zach Collins keeps San Antonio in it. Spinning and getting the layup to fall, count it plus the foul. But the Celtics scored 35 points in the second quarter, and they head into the break with a 68-57 lead. Third quarter now, Spurs battle their way back into the game. Sohan finds Romeo Langford cutting to the basket for the floater. That makes it a one-point game. Then later in the quarter, Malachi Branham drives right through the Celtics defense and banks in the lay-in. Spurs score 32 points in the third, and they trail 93-89 heading into the fourth. They keep the momentum going. Trey Jones comes up with the steal. Cue up the ball movement. Langford to Richardson. Up to Sohan for the alley-oop slam. Then a little later, Richardson delivers with another three ball, and the Spurs have tied it up again at 116 all with 40 seconds left to play. Next Boston possession, Jason Tatum spins, knocks down the tough baseline jumper. That makes it 118-116 Celtics. Spurs have a chance to tie or take the lead. Cue up Sohan from distance, and he is off the mark. That's essentially the ball game. A great Spurs effort comes up short, 121-116. 
they were in the finals last year. They know they know what to do in those moments. So for us to go out there and um, and really give us a ch our, ourselves a chance to win up until I don't know what it was, 20, 30 seconds left in that game, even when we were down early, that that says a lot about our growth. I feel like, and um, hopefully in the future we can we can have that that late push and and get the and get the win against a good team like that. Spurs next hit the road to face the Grizzlies Monday at 7 p.m. It's a big day in District 28 6A girls basketball, and we begin at Reagan High School. Rattlers taking on Churchill. Reagan strikes first in this one. Sahara Green knifes her way through the defense for the lay-in and a quick 2-0 lead, but the Chargers answer back thanks to a great shooting performance from Millie Husky. She hits the triple, and both teams are tied at 6-all. Rattlers start to pull away. Reese Stevens to Ava Schrader. She gets it to fall. Count it and one for a four-point lead. Husky keeps the Chargers in it with another three. She's got Churchill's first nine points of the game, and Reagan's got an answer. Joanna Lopez drains a straightaway three. Rattlers lead at 15-9, but the Chargers rally to win this one, 41-34. Over at Northside Sports Gym, undefeated Clark taking on Roosevelt. Cougars in cruise control in the second half. Off the miss, Catherine Mika is there for the rebound and put back. It's 66-20. And a few plays later, Sidney Pritchard finds Manal L. Jobship for the back shot. Clark rolls to a big win, 74-31. Next two teams on the court, 6-1 Johnson taking on 3-4 Marshall. Rams start this one strong. Aubrey Riojas finds Amanita Fall cutting to the basket for the lay-in and a quick 2-0 lead. Jaguars answer right back. First, Jashelle Johnson pulls up, nails the mid-range jumper. That makes it 9-7 Johnson. Then a little later, she finds Addison Iden for the layup. Jaguars open up a four-point lead, but the Rams aren't done battling. Nice give and go here from Kalisha Gary Patterson. Back to Riojas for the triple. Marshall leads 17-15 after one, but Johnson takes this one 63-49. Boys hoops this afternoon. Antonian taking on Round Rock Ignite. Apaches put on a show in the first quarter. Thanks to their work in transition. First, Isaiah Fox finds Knowledge Carter down court, and he puts it in. Count it plus the foul. Three-point play makes it 16-5. A few possessions later, Raleigh Strode comes up with a steal, finishes with the easy lay-in. Part of a 5-0 run, it's 22-7. Then how about the nice feed here from Roman Chase to Ethan Moreno in stride for another lay-in. It's a 17-point lead, and, how, and for good measure, Carter finishes with another break with a one-handed jam. Apaches led 39-9 after one. They dominate 120-59. Coming up later in sports, UTSA men's basketball is back in action at the Convo. Roadrunners gave another great effort. We'll see if they can pick up a win. All right, we'll look forward to it. Thank you, Andrew. You got it. All right, well, things are looking up for Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin. Not only his team, but other members of the NFL plan to celebrate his recovery. Tomorrow's game, we'll tell you how. And two restaurants forced to close temporarily after having their license temporarily suspended for rodent infestations. What I found when I went behind the kitchen door when we continue right after this. The health department recently suspended the licenses of two restaurants due to rodent infestations. The businesses were back up and operating when I stopped by this week to find out if they had made the required corrections. Let's go behind the kitchen door. Yaya's Thai restaurant in the 5300 block of McCullough Avenue had its license temporarily suspended following an inspection in late November that earned them a 76. The inspector found rodent droppings on plates and other signs of live rodent activity in the business. The restaurant not allowed to reopen until it removed the rodent droppings and the areas were cleaned and sanitized. I dropped by this week to see if they'd made any improvements. Have you guys been able to solve the, the rodent problem? Yeah. No. Um, well, I don't know anything about this. Hold on. Sorry, one minute. Only on his second day on the job, Sam Namdi quickly returned with some information. He said they were only closed for a day and a half to clean the restaurant. Does the rodent problem still exist or? Uh, not that I know of. I don't see them around. They're still in the process of hiring an exterminator and waiting for a follow-up inspection. They hope customers give them a second chance. We just want them to know that they're in good hands and that you know, we just want to make sure our food quality is coming out at its best in the most safe and cleanest environment. La Cabana de Jalisco also had its license suspended in late November due to a rodent problem, earning them a 73. There were rodent droppings found in dry rice storage. That food was condemned. More rodent droppings were found throughout the business. The ice machine had black and red mold-like sludge and stored knives still had food debris on them. 
Tortillas were found wrapped in a cloth rag and an employee was seen handling more tortillas with their bare hands. Hello. Hi. I'm with KSAT 12. Is there a manager I could speak with? Brian Ramirez explained they shut down for two days and thoroughly cleaned the family owned business. Have you been able to, to keep the rodents out there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot better. He hopes customers remember the high scores they've had in the past. And we do our best, we do what we can, you know what I mean? Okay. So, so when that happened, we were just kind of like, man, you know, like, we have to clean up, do everything, and that's what we did. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. All right, if you want to know who has good scores and who doesn't, we have a tool for that. Just scan this QR code with your phone. It'll take you to our mapping tool. It has the scores for San Antonio food businesses. Those reports go back six months, and they're frequently updated. Police in North Carolina are investigating a suspected murder-suicide that claimed five lives. Officers were called to a home in High Point in the central part of the state this morning after responding to reports of people screaming for help. When police arrived, they encountered two people demanding help. Police forced entry into that home and once inside found the bodies of two adults and three children. Police say there's no ongoing threat to the community. Well, new tonight, we have an update on the condition of an elementary school teacher allegedly shot by a six-year-old boy in Newport News, Virginia. The city's police chief says that first grade teacher is now in fair condition and recovering. Local news outlets identify that teacher as Abby Zwerner, which has been confirmed by her alma mater, James Madison University. Police say there was an altercation between the teacher and the student who they say pulled the gun and fired a single round at her. No other students were involved. Police say it was not an accidental shooting. Making headlines, Buffalo Bill safety Damar Hamlin is on the road to recovery after suffering cardiac arrest on the field during Monday night's game. Doctors say he's now breathing on his own. The 24-year-old surprising his teammates making a virtual appearance at the Bills meeting on Friday. Hamlin received a roaring ovation as he spoke from the hospital. To see that boy's face to uh, see him smile, see him go like this in the camera. It was everything. He made the heart symbol probably more than anything. And then he gave him a thumbs up. The Bills were, will honor the medics who saved him at tomorrow's game and pay tribute to DeMar wearing a number three patch on their jerseys. And you might have noticed this, noticed this today. Teams across the league are also showing their support for DeMar. All NFL fields will have an online outline, an outline of his number three at the 30 yard line there. You see it there. This picture shows it better than I can say it. Uh, now the game between Buffalo and Cincinnati will not be completed, and NFL officials say this will no, have no impact on the postseason. Commotion and drama at the Capitol today as representatives in the House pick their new speaker. How Kevin McCarthy finally secured his votes amid clear division. And new technology is all over our homes, and now it's making it our way, making its way into our bathrooms. The high-tech features that are turning heads at the CES and the high price that comes with it. Well, Representative Kevin McCarthy finally securing enough support from his fellow Republicans to win the speakership. Yeah, that prompted cheers on the House floor following what is now the longest vote to elect a speaker since before the Civil War. ABC's Mary Alice Park shows us the tension from the House floor. After 15 ballots and voting that stretched into the fifth day, Kevin McCarthy finally elected the new Speaker of the House. That was easy, huh? The Republican from California sworn in early Saturday morning, securing the vote after hours of drama that stretched well past midnight. Yes, I do. The 118th Congress now ready to get to work. 20 Republicans had been holding firm against McCarthy, but that finally changed after a series of closed door negotiations and many concessions. After the 14th round, McCarthy still blocked by several members of his party. At one point, Republican Mike Rogers of Alabama had to be physically pulled back during a heated confrontation with Matt Gates, a Republican opposing McCarthy. Democrats urging their fellow lawmakers to remain civil. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Madam Clerk, I rise to say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> McCarthy striking several deals with those conservative holdouts in order to secure the vote, including potentially allowing a change to the House rules so that a single lawmaker might be able to force a vote to remove the Speaker of the House. In the final round of voting, McCarthy received 216 votes over Democrat Representative Hakeem Jeffries, 212 votes. As we begin this 118th 
Congress. Let us continue to fight. Jeffries, now the minority leader, the first black lawmaker to lead a party in Congress. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. All right, back here at home, another look outside with live cam this Saturday night. Still have the cloud cover in place here in the Alamo City, although things are decently quiet. Also considering that we have some scattered rain and storms just to the southeast of Bear County. Here's the latest that I promised you on that severe thunderstorm warning earlier that was issued for southern DeWitt County. That's going to run through about 1145 p.m. This storm is capable of producing wind gusts upwards of 60 miles per hour as well as some quarter size hail as it tracks to the east at 20 miles per hour. So again, if you are in this yellow polygon in southern DeWitt County, continue to remain indoors. Some lightning it likely is pretty noisy as well, as well as some pockets of heavy rainfall associated with that cluster of storms. Also, a few spotty showers on the backside of that cell working its way through Carnes County, even stretching up into southern Wilson County. Now this all associated with a cool front that is already pumping in some of that drier air into south central Texas. So tomorrow it is going to feel just a little bit better out there. Lower humidity temperatures topping off near 70. More of the same as we head into Monday, maybe an isolated shower and then temperatures really start to warm by Tuesday and into Wednesday. More sunshine as high pressure takes back over and daytime highs in the 70s. We'll have another full look at what we're expecting over the next several days and another check at the radar in just a few. All right, you know it's Saturday night when this is a story I've been looking most forward to reading. <laughs> On your screen now is the future of the bathroom. Oh. Well, at least that's what the makers of the Numi 2.0 smart toilet think. It caused quite a crowd at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas this weekend. The features of this high-tech toilet include a built-in Amazon Alexa, mood lighting, a bidet, seat warmer, self-cleaning, and automatic seat lifting, and lowering with foot sensors to know your preference. Like a car, you know? You want to be comfortable when you sit there. <laughs> this could be the latest addition to your home for just a simple $10,000. You can put that right in your home. Self-cleaning, like this. I mean, it has mood lighting. Yeah, I guess so. What, what are you asking what else Amazon you for when you're in there doing your business? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Toilet paper. Order some poopery. <laughs> All right. There you go. We're all done. All right. Let's talk about the weather now. <laughs> yeah. As we head into the overnight hours across our southeastern counties, still some scattered rain, a couple of thunderstorms in the works. But again, that's not going to be for everybody, especially across our northern and western counties. Most of us will likely be dry through the overnight. A few lingering showers possible into early Sunday morning by sunrise. I think most of that is cleared out. Maybe just a few splashes of rain across the coastal plains. That that lower humidity, though, is going to filter in behind the cool front that is pushing through south central Texas, and it will at least feel a little bit better out there compared to all of the mugginess that we saw earlier today with that Gulf moisture that has returned. Again, another look at the radar here in San Antonio. Not a whole lot going on. Got a couple of light showers out there in Guadalupe County stretching over to the I-10 corridor, but the bulk of the heavier rain and thunderstorms continues to push across our far south eastern counties. There's that severe thunderstorm warning that continues for southern DeWitt County just south of Cuero until 1145 p.m. On the west side of that, some spotty showers have developed along the Highway 181 corridor. Floresville, Poth stretching down to Carn City and Kennedy looking at some spotty showers out that way. Some heavier downpours in northern DeWitt County just to the north of the severe warned portion of that storm. And then we have some of that activity that continues through Lavaca County just south of Hallettsville now. But again, that flash flood warning still continues for northern Lavaca County running through midnight. So we need to be careful out there on area roadways, especially if you have experienced some of those heavier downpours and slow moving downpours out there tonight. Again, very light pushing through portions of Guadalupe County near Seguin, that pushing over towards Luling as well. That activity filtering farther up to the northeast, it looks like just a little bit. But again, as we see those northerly winds take over here over the course of the next several 
several hours. The bulk of that activity is going to move southeast and closer to the coast. This all behind that cool front. Check out temperatures well off to our north. Single digits in places like Minneapolis stretching over to Bismarck. We are not going to see anything like that here in south central Texas, but that lower humidity is going to allow for at least a few more comfortable mornings, especially by tomorrow where we're waking up in the 40s and low 50s. But before we can get there, your future cast into the overnight. The bulk of those stronger storms continue to push across our southeastern counties, maybe a few spotty showers in the central portions of south central Texas. But again, by the time we wake up tomorrow, most of that should be out of here. We'll wake up to the 40s and low 50s, partly cloudy skies into the afternoon. Daytime highs for the most part, topping off in the comfortable upper 60s and low 70s. I think just shy of 70 degrees here in San Antonio. Some low 70s certainly possible across our western counties. It will be a bit breezy tomorrow morning with some wind gusts upwards of 20 to 25 miles per hour. Those winds are going to calm down a bit into the afternoon. But what that's doing, yes, as Tim mentioned earlier, probably going to allow for our mountain cedar levels to be elevated. But there are those lower humidity levels that do look to take over into the second half of the weekend. On Monday, an isolated shower, not completely out of the question. Temperatures in the upper 60s, mornings in the 40s. And then high pressure takes back over Tuesday and Wednesday. Highs in the 70s already. And then we'll monitor for another front to move in, knock those temperatures down just a little bit by Thursday, guys. I'm just on the roller coaster. No cold stuff. Oh, that's true. I could use another shot of cold stuff. Nothing crazy. Just a little cold shot. Mia. We'll see what we can do. Make it happen. We'll see what we can do. Just for Tim. <laughs> Just for Tim. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, UTSA back in action on the court. Yeah, that's right. The Roadrunners are in a serious conference battle right now, trying to get back in the conference race. Today they took on Western Kentucky. We'll show you how they did. Plus, the Longhorns picked up a tough, hard-fought win on the road in their first game since Chris Beard was fired. Got that too next. UTSA men's basketball back at home hosting Western Kentucky with a chance to win back-to-back -back conference games for the first time this season. Pick it up. First half, Jacob Germany gets the Roadrunners' first points, throwing down the two-handed jam off the inbounds pass. And then John Bugs the third crosses over defender, knocks down the mid-range jumper. But UTSA plays most of the early minutes from behind. Off the miss here on the other end, Davion McKnight flies in for the rebound and the reverse layup. Then they set 11-4 Hilltoppers. Roadrunners start to chip away. DJ Richards from the wing. That three ball drops in to make it a two-point game. And then a few plays later, Josh Farmer finds Germany at the top of the key, and he hits the jumper through contact, count it, and one. Roadrunners pull back within a point, but Western Kentucky pulls away from there. UTSA drops to one and four in conference with a 64, excuse me, 74-64 loss. Texas Longhorns play their first game without recently fired Chris Beard at the helm, taking on Oklahoma State this afternoon, and the Burnt Orange are in control late in the first half. Tyrese Hunter gets the floater to fall, and Texas leads 32-24 at the break. Second half, Cowboys piece together a furious rally. Caleb Boone with authority. That's a dunk. OK, State comes all the way back to make it a one-point game late, but the Longhorns have an answer. First, Marcus Carr hits the fadeaway jumper to stop the bleeding. Then with two minutes left, Brock Cunningham drills a three from the wing, and the sixth-ranked Longhorns survive and win 56. 46. Number 19, Baylor went to overtime against Kansas State this afternoon. Game tied at 93 in OT. Adam Flagler weaves his way to the rim and puts it up and in. Bears up two with 46 seconds left, but the Wildcats came right back. Ismael Masood knocks down a huge three, and Kansas State knocks off Baylor 97-95. Texas A&M looking for their fourth straight win today, taking on LSU. Second half, Aggies in control. Andre Gordon fakes the shot. Finds Henry Coleman the third for the slam. That gets the bench on their feet. It's 44-33 A&M. Then a few plays later, Gordon with a nice feed to Julius Marble for the one-handed jam. He finishes with 17 points. Aggies win their 10th of the season, 69-56. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. There is a lot on the line for the Cowboys tomorrow as they still have a chance to win the NFC East. The Cowboys win and an Eagles loss would clinch the second straight division title for the boys. And with a little extra help, they could even earn the number one overall seed. Of course, the first thing they have to do is defeat Washington, who's been eliminated from the playoffs altogether. As head coach Mike McCarthy concerned about the commanders playing a little riskier now that they have nothing to lose. Definitely, but you know, let's, let's be honest. You know, Ron Ron's always been aggressive uh, with with uh, fourth down decisions. I mean, he's probably one of the first ones to uh, to go that route. So it's only going to help us because uh, any type of 
stressful situa situation that's created in Sunday's game. You know, obviously it gives us a chance to compete and win in that particular situation, but also it gives us more experience. So, yeah, I, I, I hope they do. And lastly, one final congratulations to Lindsey Scott Jr. The UIW quarterback was named the FCS Offensive Player of the Year and won the Walter Payton Award. Scott finished with 71 total touchdowns, 60 passing, 11 rushing, and he threw for 4,600 passing yards with a 71% completion percentage. And oh yeah, the deepest playoff run in Cardinals history. Congratulations to Scott on his time here at UIW. Congrats to him. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Courtney talked too much. That's all the time we have tonight. It's all my fault. We'll see you tomorrow. Watch TMSA. Good night. <laughs>